Our next speaker is Helena Norberg Hodge. She is the founder of Local Futures, formerly known as ISEC, and also the International Alliance for Localization. She's also a founding member of the IFG board and has also been the recipient of numerous awards. Um, she has I just have to say one, if you haven't read Ancient Futures, which is perhaps an ancient book, it's one of your older books, I really um, advise you to do so because it's still so relevant today. And it was, for me, one of those real aha moments early on when I was um, working on these issues. So Helen is here. She's been talking about localization for eons. And so it's very appropriate that she's on this panel in particular. So please welcome Helen and Norbert Hodge. I've been, I've been at this for 40 years now, and by birth I was very globalized, Swedish, English, German, and that took me into learning lots of languages, and that took me into activism involving about 50 different language groups and working regularly in about a dozen countries. And I'm still on the road far too often. I hate traveling. But I really believe that we need a global movement to deal with a global problem, which is the global economy. And I think uh, uh, Doug was talking yesterday about not jumping into action. And I so agree with that. And Deb now mentioned we use the term in the IFG, education as activism. I think we need big picture activism. We need to rapidly get out a bigger picture to create a much broader, united movement for fundamental change. Um, some people that I work with, including Russell Brand, who I've just been spending some time with, calls this fundamental change revolution. And so does Chris Hedges, who's going to be here with me in a couple of weeks. He's also using the language of revolution. I prefer to use fundamental systems change as the language. Uh, both of these men are totally committed to peaceful, nonviolent activism. And the term revolution may sound a bit um, infer that they, they would like to see a violent revolution. We're also not talking about the sort of thing that we had in the past with revolution. We really are now talking about the 99% waking up to the immense suffering that is being imposed on them by a blind, giant, techno-economic system. It's a, it's a juggernaut that we should best understand as a machine that is being pushed by less than 1% of the global population pushed, actively pushed, far less than 1% of the global population because in increasing the scale of this techno-economic juggernaut, what we're talking about is the trade treaties that we have been trying to raise awareness about in the IFG. These trade treaties are the, the, is the arena where governments are sitting around the table lobbied by big banks and big corporations to give those giant global businesses more freedom. Free trade is freedom for the giants to move in and out of local, regional, national spaces and economies. The latest in, incarnation of this, the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, sounds very friendly, is going to further this situation where corporations can sue governments if they dare to protect the environment or their citizens against the rape and pillage that is happening in the name of free trade. So we, we really, really need to wake up to this fundamental matrix of the globalizing path versus a shift transition towards localizing. It has been difficult to convince a lot of people, particularly I would say on the, on the political left, of the need to see localization as a systemic 
shift as sort of the matrix. I think it's because within the left there's been a, a, a tremendous idealism about international collaboration, international solidarity, and as I was saying, I believe we need an international movement. I'm totally committed to international collaboration, but we need to distinguish between collaboration to protect Mother Earth and to protect society and collaboration to increase the scale of economic activity. And as we increase the scale of economic activity, we're talking about increasing the scale of the players, the giants that are merging, Exxon Mobil. It's not enough to be a giant multinational. To survive within the globalizing rat race, you have to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And what we have, as I say, is a, a system that we should understand as a sort of machine, an empire in the sky that is, it is a, a tsunami that is about to hit in a much, much more dramatic way than we've experienced. We're beginning to see it in many countries where suddenly government says, sorry, can't afford to look after our national parks, don't have the money, can't afford to look after the sick and the elderly, can't afford um, good education, can't afford, can't afford, we're too poor. And what's happening is that everything we care about is threatened. This is why I believe we have a huge opportunity. We have an opportunity to reach out to multiple special interest groups, those who are concerned about the widening gap between rich and poor, those who are concerned about the epidemic of illness, the epidemic of depression, the epidemic of pollution and large-scale infrastructure projects that threaten their local communities, the loss of species as we speak, completely connected to the loss of languages and cultures, the cultural and biological diversity are inextricably interlinked and they are threatened across the planet. So localizing as a systemic shift away from this madness needs the big picture activism to make all those narrow constituencies, all of them very important and valid, but to link together to see that this escalation in the global path, above all, is a massive increase in energy consumption every step of the way. Globalizing the economy means the distances are growing uh, by the minute. We have countries importing and exporting the same food. Last time we looked, the US was exporting 900,000 tons of beef and veal, while importing, guess what, about 900,000 tons of beef and veal. The UK exports roughly as much milk and butter as it imports, and regularly you will have fish flown across the world, apparently tuna here from the East Coast will be thrown to Japan to be weighed before it comes back to the sushi bars here. Shrimp are flown from the UK to Thailand to be peeled, flown back again. Apples flown to South Africa to be washed and waxed, flown back again. When we talk about CO2 emissions, let's link it to corporate rule and the systemic escalation in CO2 emissions. Let's really get away from an Al Gore framing which told you go home and change your light bulbs to something rather toxic, don't drive your car, don't travel. In the meanwhile, the purveyors of the global narrative are traveling faster and more than ever. I actually, this can be heresy in environmental circles, but I actually encourage people who are involved in trying to raise awareness and to protect this planet of ours to travel. One of the problems has been that precisely the ecologically conscious people have not traveled and have not therefore 
as I see it, been exposed to a global enough view of what's happening. So there's a lot of rethinking that needs to be done. And I'm not talking about traveling as a mass consumer. I'm, and I'm not talking about, travel, as I say, traveling uh, for other reasons really than to try to learn, to try to protect, to try to build up the movement. And perhaps you can allow yourself a holiday now and then as well. Because it is not the issue. The issue is what Bill said yesterday, what we can do collectively. So they were talking about, essentially about, collective policy change. What do we decide on? What are the priorities? And there, I think there are some interesting models. When Russell Brand talks about revolution, he's speaking very similar language to someone named Beppe Grillo in Italy, who essentially was saying the same thing, and also what Ralph Nader was saying yesterday. You know, really, when you vote left and right, you're voting for the same corporate machine. So let's get over this. Let's really look at the issues. Beppe Grillo in Italy was speaking out as a well-known comedian, saying, completely corrupt, doesn't matter how you vote, we're getting the same corrupt governments working for the same corrupt banks and corporations. <laughs> so he said, we need to build up a people's movement. We need fundamental change. And they did that. They set out in 2006 to build up a people's movement. They did not use the media, they used the internet, but very importantly, they used the internet to encourage people to meet up locally. So they had local groups that then started running people locally, politically. And then suddenly they burst forth in the 2012 election and they took half of Berlusconi's vote, they took a third of the entire vote. Now, Beppe agrees, well, I, you know, I felt very strongly before I knew him that it was not a good idea to go in at that stage. We need a bigger movement before we think we can go into the political arena. So I urge you all to think in terms of building up this people's movement quickly, we don't have a lot of time, that through engaging with one another about our collective vision, about how we are collectively going to make this transformation, and as I say, localizing for me and for an increasing number of people is the clear opposite matrix to the continuing global monoculture corporate machine. Localizing is not about just acting local. It's not about buying local. If I say to people, buy local food, only eat local, in many parts of the world they'll be eating cotton or coffee. We're talking about working to build up the localized structures that not only allow for, but that nurture diversified small-scale food production. As Vandana pointed out, that is the only way to feed the world. It is far more productive in every sense of the word. And amazingly, we now have in the US, you know, a rise in farmers markets. There are about 8,000 new farmers markets. Roughly, I just read recently, roughly as many as we have banks in the, in the US. We now have 8,000 new farmers markets. What those markets are doing is creating the sort of co-op of the future, a structure where you have cooperation between producers and consumers to create a market that is impervious, not entirely impervious, but almost impervious to the machinations of the dominant global market, which will fly in and deliver things from 10,000 miles away, costing less than local products. One of the many bits of information we need to look at in our big picture activism is how can it be that food which is uh, fresh and needs to be fresh and is perishable, how can something from 10,000 miles away be delivered in your local market costing less than a fresh local apple or banana from only a mile away? That's what's happening because we have not been told by either left or right 
that we are subsidizing the long distances. By subsidizing the long distances, by subsidizing export-import, we are subsidizing these giant corporations. We want to shift those subsidies, and with that, we want to shift the regulations that deregulate the global while over-regulating the local. You probably don't know that big hotel chains a long time ago were lobbying in Washington, D.C. that the government should tighten regulations for bed and breakfast. You had to have thick fire doors and fire mattresses, toxic, by the way, using dangerous chemicals. Uh, and this was all in order to destroy the small-scale competition. Even Monsanto lobbied in Washington to regulate genetic engineering laboratories and um, uh, production, knowing that it would destroy the small players, but not them. So we've had a process of over-regulating the small, the local, the national, while deregulating the global. And as Ralph said yesterday, very wisely, as things become more localized, they become more transparent, more accountable. In the current global system, we have a situation that I often talk about, our arms have become so long, we can't see what our hands are doing. So very often, without realizing it, we support ideas that feed into this global system that come back to harm us. What are we going to do when we go to the supermarket? And we, how do we know if that packet of olives we bought, how do we know whether it was uh, poisoning ecosystems, using slave labor? We have to do a, you know, spend hours reading, and now, of course, we know we can't trust the label. Bringing the economy home, bringing the economy home for almost every basic need we have, particularly around food, but also shelter clothing, food, clothing, shelter. There is no reason whatsoever why we shouldn't be supporting a very rapid transition. And the rapid transition needs the help of policy change. But what is so fabulous is that around the world, there is a whole tapestry of localized economic initiatives that are being created as we speak and it's thrilling to, to meet you know, the first CSA farmer outside Beijing to see it's happening even in the so-called less developed part of the world, a conscious shortening of distances, of relocalizing, diversifying on the land, diversifying is the only way that we can reduce our ecological footprint while increasing productivity. The localization movement also has um, uh, economists like Michael Schumann supporting an awareness raising and actual transition towards more local financing. But beware that many of the proponents of localization today, from my point of view, are naively ignoring the realities of the techno-economic juggernaut and embracing 3D printing and an internet dependence, an internet economic dependence as part of the localizing part. Beware that there are so many mind games or basically a lot of naivety about how this dominant techno-economic system functions, which is why I'm so grateful also to Jerry and to Doug for calling to us together today, let us really try to get the word out. But let's get the word out about technology as part of a system, a techno-economic system. It is completely interlinked. We have to look at who has funded those technologies, how our taxes have subsidized it, who has been promoting it, and then look at the technologies that can really be helpful and useful only where society is top dog. We have inverted something in the modern era that never happened before. Previously, cultures shaped the economy, shaped the technologies. In the modern era, mega technologies and mega economic structures 
the economy is shaping culture. And I quickly want to say something about how that shaping of culture is influencing children worldwide. I've witnessed this in very remote cultures like Bhutan, which you will have heard of, and Ladakh, where I've worked for many years, and West Tibet. There I saw, in the early years, the happiest, most relaxed and joyous people I had ever encountered. They had this, a, a deep sense of self-respect that made the self not, no need to prove yourself, to prove that you're good-looking or clever or powerful. An amazing, joyous, relaxed sense of self. I saw how media and television and tourism brought in a stereotypical urban consumer identity that made these children feel that they were backward, primitive, ugly, stupid, happened very quickly. And I saw that the message from the media was, if you want to be loved, if you want to be respected, seen and heard, you've got to have the latest running shoes, you've got to have the right label jeans, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. It took me a while to realize that exactly the same thing was going on in my native Sweden. You know, where six-year-old girls, beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed, thin girls were saying, I'm not going to eat, I want to look like Barbie doll, I'm not thin enough. The message of this dominant corporate machine is, if you want to be loved, if you want to belong, you've got to buy our stuff. The end result is competition and envy. It's not love and connection. Well, guess what? We have a very quick path towards the localizing that will regain the joy and the self-respect that our children and that all of us long for. It's about turning to one another, away from the media. Face-to-face, -face, localized culture is what can very quickly regain our sense of joy, our sense of happiness. I hope you will come two weeks from now to a follow-up to this meeting, which we're calling Voices of Hope in a Time of Crisis. This is where we're launching our International Alliance for Localization. And we have Chris Hedges joining us and people from Brazil, Africa, India. It's an international alliance. Please let people know about it and please join us. Thank you.